to sing the battle belongs to him alone because he is victorious over everything. Many followers of Jesus feel the calling that God has placed on their lives to take the message of the gospel to the nations. But where they are now and where they want to be is a road that's filled with uncertainty and lots of challenges in getting there. 
Only one out of 100 people who inquire about going to the nations actually get there. Launch Global specializes in developing people for overseas cross-cultural work. Our training is built on the experiences of laborers and leaders from around the world, ultimately helping a person to thrive in overseas work. Our Launch Global communities are designed to help people experience what life is like on a missional team. Life on Life coaching builds ministry skills, develops character, and emphasizes an abiding relationship with Jesus. They act as a navigational tool to help you discern where God has called you and how He has equipped you for His work. All this before you've stepped on a plane or quit your job. If you are looking for a clear path to the nations or if you know where you're going but need help getting there, we invite you to learn more to see if this is the next step in the journey that God has called you on. Hi, good morning, friends. My name is Will Whitaker. I actually grew up here in Paris, and this was my church home for 18 years, and I'm so thankful and honored to be here um, speaking with y'all and getting to share the ministry that God has called me into in this next season of my life. I, uh, it's cool, actually, Vacation Bible School almost 20 years ago is where I first prayed to receive the Lord in my life, and um, it was here, yeah, at FEC. Absolutely. That's a big moment worthy of applause. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, this has been our church home through many highs and lows in our life and my life. And um, I've had the honor, um, it's just such an honor to, to, to share um, this ministry. And so uh, really first got to um, God started developing a passion for unreached people groups here in the youth ministry at First Baptist as Nathan Law was our youth minister uh, eight or 10 years ago. And he shared with our youth group then that there are close to 3 billion people in the world that, um, more than 3 billion really, that, that never have a chance to hear the gospel. And so that was something that really, really changed my paradigm. I, uh, you know, growing up here in Paris in the Bible Belt, I thought everyone knows the gospel, just like everyone knows gravity. My, my feet stay on the ground. Everyone knows that because of gravity. Everyone knows the gospel, but that's not that's not the case. And so um, it really, really changed my understanding. And 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 actually, Paul talks about this in Romans ten fourteen through fifteen. He says that how are these people going to call on the one in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe without hearing? How will they hear unless someone preaches to them? How will someone preach unless they are sent to preach? And so that's really what I'll be working with Launch Global to do is to send people to preach and prepare people to, to go and live long-term among these unreached people groups to share the good news of Jesus so that they have an opportunity to hear about the gospel. And so I would love to invite any of y'all uh, to partner with me in that and, and to hear more. I would love to share more about that with you. And, and, and uh, y'all have, this church has partnered with me in my life in so many ways, which I'm thankful for and would love in, in to invite y'all into partnering with me in this through prayer, through financial support, through receiving ministry updates through email. I'll be in the foyer at the end of the service and would love to get your contact information and um, share more with you about that if you're interested in, in partnering with me in this ministry. Thank you all so much. There was a moment when the lights went out When death acclaimed its victory the king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history there on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned one final breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn 
Where sacrifice was made As the heavens roll Oh, help me, Jesus Oh, help me, Lord of heaven and earth Oh, help me, Jesus Bibles open to the book of Nehemiah, we find that is such an exciting book. And we're going to ask that God would bless us in our study today as we search the truths and the depths of Nehemiah. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we listen to that music today that just brought praise to you, the man, we just want to praise your name. No other name under heaven has been given 
that we must be saved. No other name in heaven that has been given that we find ourselves worshiping and praising. You have given us your word. We want to honor that by studying it, looking at it, and allowing the word of God to transform our lives. And so thank you for your word today. May the decisions that have been made in our hearts even this morning have lasting results for your glory and honor. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember the first time that I stepped foot in Nepal, I began to notice something very funny. Even though I was there on a mission trip, that we would drive out to the outskirts outside the valley of uh, Kathmandu, we would begin to notice there were bricks stacked up. It seemed like wherever you went, there were just stacks of these red bricks that were everywhere, whether in the city or out in the countryside, along the roads, there were bricks everywhere. Well, finally, my curiosity got the best of me. I asked one of the young men that was with us, what's the deal with all the bricks being stacked up everywhere? And then he said, to my embarrassment, he said, just a few years ago, Man, we had a major earthquake, an earthquake that came and so the bricks were there in order to help the people to rebuild their homes, rebuild their businesses, and, and to place a, to build for a shelter. A little embarrassed, I wasn't aware of all the tragedy they went through, but that's why the bricks were there. But besides an earthquake, when you're out in the countryside and you see a wall that is down, left in rubbish there on the ground, or you see a wall around a house broken down, you begin to wonder what has happened. What would cause a wall to fall to the ground? Uh, One of the things we would say is just simply neglect. Just neglect, not giving the proper attention to the wall, inspecting it, looking it over. Neglect. The second thing that you might assume that has happened is apathy. That the owner of the wall just didn't care. He just didn't care whether the wall stood, whether it fell, whether it was in good condition or bad condition, but he just didn't care. Another reason is an enemy has come along. An enemy could be an animal. An animal comes along and rubs on it and begins to deteriorate the wall to such a point that he finally pushes it over. Or it could be a man that is an enemy that comes and says, you know what, I I want to vandalize this property, I want to vandalize this wall. But also we find erosion happens that can destroy a wall. Erosion can come, the heat, the sun, the rain, the cold, the ice, can destroy a wall that is set up. But what we discover today as we open our Bibles to the book of Nehemiah is that the walls of Jerusalem have come down. And they are left in a heap of rubble and a a heap of mess that they are down on the ground. When you see a wall around a city, you traveled in Europe very much, when you see those great imposing walls, you think of protection, You think of pride in the good sense, that they're proud of their city. You think of strength. You think of many different words that you could describe. But none of those words could describe what is happening in Jerusalem right now. Look with me in verse 1 of chapter 1 and notice the description of what is happening to Nehemiah's heart and also what is happening to Jerusalem. It said that the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakalah, now it happened in the month uh, Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hananiah, one of my brothers, and some man from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the providence who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the walls of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. Now, verse 4, now it came about when I heard these words, I sat down, and notice his response, I wept 
and mourn for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven, and I said, I beseech thee, O Lord, the God of heaven, the great and the awesome God who preserves the covenant and everlasting for those who love him and keep his commandments. Well, a great question to ask is what happened to the walls? Well, we need to understand a little bit about the history that we've been looking at uh, recently as we've been studying through the different books of this time period. We find there were three different deportations, three different times that Babylon came to Jerusalem and took out some of the people. You remember some of the first people were people like Daniel, people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the last time they deported a group was in 587 B.C., an important date to remember, 587 B.C. And when they come this last time, they said, man, we're tired of fooling with the Jews. We're tired of the rebellion. We're tired of what they're doing. They went into Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, took out the gold, all the things of value, and took it back with them to Babylon. And then when they came to the city, they burned the city, tore down the walls, and left Jerusalem just in a pile of rubbish and a heap of ruins. And now we find that the walls are down. Three times they were deported to Babylon. But listen to this. Three times there is a new exodus coming back into the land. The first time we find the exodus came was in 539 B.C., and we find the name Zerubbabel. That's a great serial name, isn't it? Zerubbabel. And uh, Zerubbabel led the group also with Joshua, and their responsibility was what? To rebuild the temple. Man, we need a place where God's people can come and worship and celebrate the one true and living God. But there was another exodus back into the land, and that came in 485 B.C. under King Artaxerxes. And we find that Ezra led this group. Ezra is coming back, and he's going to lead a revival as a priest and bring about a spiritual renew, renewal. But the third one is what we're looking at today, and that is when Nehemiah received this burden from God and Nehemiah comes back 13 years later after Ezra, and he comes to rebuild the walls. It's very interesting to know that the king at this time was Artaxerxes, and his mother, his stepmother, was somebody you know named Esther. And I believe that Esther had a great influence on him to show him the favor to the Jews. And he allowed this cupbearer that we're going to see in a moment to come back. But one thing that we find as we read in chapter 1 about Nehemiah that we see over and over and over again is that he was concerned. He was concerned. And that kind of emphasizes and underlines everything that happens. The first thing that I want you to see, that he was concerned to the point of asking. The point of asking. In verse 1, we are introduced to Nehemiah, and his name literally means the Lord who has comforted. And we find that Nehemiah's name plays out so well because when he goes to Jerusalem, we find that he brings incredible comfort to the people in Jerusalem because he rallies them and says, hey, we can do it. Let's build this wall. And and so he brings great comfort to the people that were there. But while he's in Persia, in the capital city of Susa, we find that he was a cupbearer. And there's no more important position in all the kingdom probably than to be the cupbearer to the king. Because he tasted everything that the king ate. He drank everything that the king was going to drink in order to make sure that nobody was poisoning the king. And some have said there's probably no one closer to the king except his wife. And so Nehemiah had an important position, a position of comfort, a position of wealth, 
in a sense, prosperity because everything the king was eating. We find that Nehemiah was eating, and he was a cupbearer. But what you need to know about Nehemiah, he wasn't a priest. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a deacon. He wasn't anything like that. He was just an ordinary person that lived, that, that God is going to use, which says to your life and my life, you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be on television. Man, you can be an ordinary guy. You can be an ordinary gal, an ordinary a student. And God can use your life if you will avail it to him to do mighty things. We find about him that he's never been to Jerusalem. He was born in captivity. And he's never been outside of Persia that we know of and understand but we do know this, that he had a heart for Jerusalem. Why? Because every true Jew, or we could say it this way, every Jew that's turned on to the living God had a heart for Jerusalem. Hold your place in the book of Nehemiah, but if you would turn, I, I want you to see it. Turn with me to Psalms 137. Psalms 137 and I want you to notice verse 5 and 6. This really describes the heart of a Jew that was in captivity, that was really on fire for the Lord, that loved the Lord. Listen to these words. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget how to play the harp. Lord, if I forget Jerusalem... Take away the skill out of my hand. But then notice, may my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If, it I, if I do not remember you, if I, I do not re exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Turn back to the book of Nehemiah and we find that as he's there, man, he has this longing for this land because he is a Jew that understands about the temple that understands about worship, understand how God has placed his name there. And man, he's concerned about it. And we find that he asked his brother. Now it says brother, how do we know uh, this gentleman's really his brother? It could mean like, hey, bro. It could mean, hey, friend. But we find in chapter 7, verse 2, he describes him as what? My brother. And so his brother has gone to Jerusalem, comes back, and he says, hey, tell me about what it's like in Jerusalem. I want to know. And his brother describes it in these horrible words. Listen to this description. He says to Nehemiah, it's in great distress, it's in great shame, and the walls are broken down. We find, first of all, that Nehemiah was concerned enough to ask the question. He was concerned enough to ask, how is it in Jerusalem? And that's where concern really begins, is asking. And you know, in our lives, sometimes we never ask. We never ask about our neighbor that was sick. Oh, I heard about her, but we never ask. We never ask about a need of another person. We never ask about what God is doing in the life of the church. We just never ask. You see, real concern begins when you begin to ask. You begin to inquire. You begin to say, man, I, I want to know what is happening. And Nehemiah was concerned enough that he asked the question. He asked. And it brings me to the question of each of our hearts, particularly my heart this morning. Am I concerned enough to ask? Ask. Ask the right questions. Ask about somebody else. Ask about the needs of somebody else's life. Or is my only concern is about my welfare? See, he asks. But the second thing I want to draw your attention to he had a concern to the point of weeping. When Nehemiah heard through his brother about the condition of the city, man, it moved him. He, he was bothered by it. 
He didn't like what he heard about the city. In fact, notice verse 4, it says that he wept. If you know anything about the Eastern culture, when it says that somebody weeps, it's not just a tear that runs down their face. It is a loud cry. Notice it says he wept. Notice the word, what does it say? He mourned. He mourned. It would be a, a loud expression of grief. He allowed his life to be moved. And there are times that God will move in your life emotionally and impact your life, and you've got to allow it and not resist it. You see what he did when God spoke through his brother of what was happening in the city. We find that he allowed his emotions to be bothered. Notice, it wasn't a day. It said, for what? For many days that he wept, he mourned over it. But it's not unusual for men of God to weep, nor is it unusual for women of God to weep, students to weep. We find that Jeremiah weep for his people. In Jeremiah 9.1, he's known as the weeping prophet. In the book of Acts, Paul talks about tears. You know, when you think of the Apostle Paul, I, I, in my mind, I think of somebody like Dr. Toller, don't you? Tough, just move in, not afraid. But even we find he was moved to tears. And I've been with Dr. Toller in Israel. And I've seen him at the, at the tomb of Jesus. And I've seen that strong man just begin to cry and, and quiver as he thinks about what Christ has done for his life. And so we find that Jeremiah cried, Paul cried, but we also find that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Would you pray that God would keep your heart tender? It's no virtue to say, man, I'm tough. I'm never moved by anything. Nothing doesn't shock me. Nothing doesn't bother my life. Nehemiah allowed the emotions of what he was hearing to affect his life. And I think we need to pray that, that God would give us a tender heart. It's nothing to be arrogant about, nothing to be proud about to say, man, man, I'm never moved over anything, that nothing ever grips my life. Pray that God would give you a tender heart. He was concerned enough to be moved. He allowed himself to cry, weep, mourn for days. But thirdly, we see his concern in something else. He was concerned to the point of prayer. You see a progression taking place here. He asked. He was moved in emotions. And then we find that he was willing to pray. You see, he had a burden on his heart. But what he did in prayer was this. He wanted to make sure that his burden lined up with God. Now, see, you can have a burden, but it not, might not be God's will. It might not be what God wants you to be involved in or what God wants you to do. And so what he did, he, he took this burden and he brought it before the Lord. And he wanted to make sure in prayer and fasting that we find that he has given it to the Lord and what he was doing was lining up with the Lord. And so he prayed. By the way, for a moment, if you would, look in chapter 2, verse 1. We won't read it, but just kind of mark it down there. From this time to chapter 2, verse 1, is four months. Four months. We find that he prayed and fasted and continued to seek the Lord before there was an answer. It says to you and I that we are not to pray about an issue just one day and say, well, I tried, I prayed, nothing happened. We find that he prayed for four months before he got his invitation that the king opened the door for him to be able to say what was on his heart. 
And so what our passage is saying here is that we've got to continue to keep praying. Continue to be steadfast. Don't give up on prayer. Stay with it. Four months later, the answer to prayer came. But we find that he was on his knees praying. And then notice it says he was fasting. You ever get an irritable if you miss lunch? You know, you get kind of short, I miss lunch. Or, ladies, your husband ever get a little agitated, dinner's late? Man, dinner ought to be served at 5.30. Why is it 5.35? Man, the world's coming in. I'm hungry. Man, he had no time for food. Why? Man, he had a burden that God has put on his heart. Food was secondary. Man, he fasted and, and sought the Lord. And he wanted to see what God was doing. Notice what it says in verse 5 as he went to the Lord. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord, the God of heaven. I love that. You see, they tried once before to build the walls, and the king stopped it. And he knew that if it was going to happen, he needed divine intervention. He needed divine intervention of God. If these walls were ever going to be built, it wasn't going to be by Nehemiah. It was going to be by prayer and God using Nehemiah, and Nehemiah knew it. Look what he says in verse 5. I said, I beseech you, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God. Man, isn't that true? Isn't he an awesome God? I knew of one pastor that would not allow his kids to use the word awesome about, man, that's awesome, that store, that ice cream is awesome. He said that word awesome is only reserved for God. That God, He is an awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love Him and keep His commandments. He trusts was in God. He was laying it before God. He was trusting Him. For the Bible tells us that we are to cast all of our cares in 1 Peter 5, 7 upon Him. This week, this came to my mind and my heart, and I wrote this down. It says, the impossible is made possible through prayer. Even though I said it, I like it. And I like it even more because I said it. It goes like this. The impossible is made possible through prayer. And he knew this. You know, all through the Bible, we see men and women of God praying. And men, when they prayed, something happened. Gideon prayed for a sign from God of a fleece, and God answered that prayer. Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still, and the sun stood still. Moses prayed for Miriam to be healed, and she was healed. Peter and James prayed that the lame man might be healed and was healed. Listen, God works when we pray with such earnestness in one's life. He wanted the involvement of God from the very beginning in this burden that he had. And so we see that he cared. But one more thing that we see, and I want you to notice in your Bible, he was concerned enough to the point of doing. I like that. You know, for a lot of people, we're concerned enough that, that we might ask, how are you doing? What's going on? What can I do? We might ask. And then a lot of us are concerned enough that we might feel, did you hear what happened? Wow, that makes me feel terrible. I, I can't believe what they're going through in their lives. And then a lot of us will say, you know what? We need to take that to God in prayer. But man, when you get to the mountain of doing there's very few that ever show up. Very few that ever show up. And we want you to know he was concerned enough to be involved and said, man, basically what he was saying to God is, God, here am I. Send me. God, I'm available. If you can use just a simple cupbearer, no skills really. God, if you could use me, man, I'm willing. Notice his prayer in verse 11. 
O Lord, I beseech thee, may thy ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who delight to revere thy name and make thy servant successful. God, today, make me successful today and grant him compassion before this man, talking about the king, and I was a cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah goes before the king and lays his request out, but he was saying, I'm ready to do. I'm ready to do. You know what a sacrifice that was? Man, he had a pretty cush job. Man, he had to eat, taste steak every day, taste goat every day, to taste the meat every day, drink the king's best wine, and he did it every day. Man, he had a good job, but he was willing to give it up to go to the ratty, ravish city of Jerusalem because God has put a burden on his heart. Well, that's the story of Nehemiah. But what do we take away? What is it that we've read this week? What is it that we studied and pondered this week that, that we are to take away from the book of Nehemiah? The first one is this. Be concerned. Be concerned. It's always been the mark of Christians that men were concerned, genuinely concerned. Concerned about the lives of people. About the name of God. That his name should be exalted. So what do you need to do? You need to be concerned enough that you ask, that you feel, that you pray and fast, and that you do. So how would you put it in play? It would be like this. Ask God for a ministry if you don't have one. Ask God, God, give me a ministry. Show me as a cupbearer. Show me as an ordinary man, ordinary woman, what you would have for me to do. God, I know that you can use Nehemiah. God, you can use me. Ask God to give you a ministry. Second, keep your heart tender. Man, God uses those that have tender hearts, those that can feel and sense and know and speak and hear the Word of God, be moved by the Word of God. Keep a tender heart and then pray. Know God's direction. Seek God's direction and then do. Join in God's work. Join in his work. Second, what you notice when you read uh, through Nehemiah, what, what you see about this man was incredible character of this man. Major on the character of your life. If I had one thing to say to our students here today, to our young people that are here, is major on character. Worry about building yourself up in the Lord, and he will reveal the ministry. God uses men and women who have great character in their lives. In preparing this week, I came across something by Stephen Davey that he wrote down about the characteristics of Nehemiah. And they speak of his character. He gives uh, 26 of them. Listen to these. He was compassionate. He prayed. Eleven prayers are in the book of Nehemiah. He knew the Old Testament scriptures. He had a definite goad. When something had to be done, he went directly to the person who could do something about it. That's good. We need to remember that. Number six, he depended upon God. He knew what to ask. He seized up the job, sized up the job before it started the work. Number nine, he knew how to be a diligent worker. Number 10, he knew how to take hold and be diligent in responsibilities. He did not let opposition from those on the outside stop him, and he faced opposition. 
He knew how to settle differences among people. He was an example of his own message. I guess you could say he walked the walk. Number 14, he was a man of keen discernment. He did not let personal criticism stop him. He did not excuse wrongdoing regardless of who did it. Number 17, he had respect for authority. He gave God credit for his accomplishments. Number 19, he put the emphasis on the spiritual life, not just building the walls. He required a higher standard for those in spiritual leadership. He expected more, required more of them. He refused to accommodate sin, even when sinful behavior had become the culture acceptance of that day. Number 22, he took personal distress and hurt to God. He was willing to suffer injustice for the sake of God's work. He stayed focused on the gold and did not succumb to the dangers, the risks, the obstacles, the hardships that stood in his way. Number 25, he had moral strength and courage when everybody around him did not. 26, the last one, he did not give up when everybody else around him had given up. Listen. God looks for men and women of character. Sometimes we're in a hurry to do. Even Paul spent some time after his salvation preparing himself for the ministry. Be a person of character. That's who God uses the most in the ministry of his work are those who will focus on character, and Nehemiah did. Number three, what walls in your life are broken down? If we could be real and transparent for a moment, I'm going to ask you what walls in your life are broken down? What walls lie in rubbish all around you today that that you need to rebuild. For some of you, if you're honest, it would be the walls of getting back into the Word of God. Oh, we've got the reading plan, and Tim says it every week, and and we know about it, but the truth is we're not in God's Word. And you need to begin today to make that commitment to yourself that I'm going to build the wall of of the word. I'm going to rebuild that in my life that's been torn down. For some of you, it's the wall of sin that's torn down the wall. Some of you, it's ignorance that's torn down the wall, but you need to rebuild it with the word. Some of you need to rebuild it in witnessing. There's people all around you that need your witness at work and you're not witnessing and you've just allowed that part of the wall of your life to stand and in crumbles and to lie on the ground and today you need to say you know what that wall need to be rebuilt we've got others that are faithful in coming to the church but you're not tithing that you have allowed that area because you've got other needs in your life and you know i'll make it up next week and next week never comes And you give an excuse to yourself, you give an excuse to the Lord, and you're not being used by God in a way. It's not that we just want your money here, we we need your money. No, it's not that. It's that God expects that because it places your priorities in the right line. Seek you first the kingdom of God, right? And then all these other things will be added into you. See, there's some that are here today that have allowed the walls of their life to be fallen down, and you're opening yourself up to Satan's attack. 
Could it be the area of character? You're not being truthful. You're not being honest. You're not being straightforward. What walls is the Holy Spirit showing you in your life right now that need to be built before something greater, before the enemy takes advantage of you? But when we talk about building walls, there's also something else that we must say. What walls in your life need to be torn down? Are there some walls that you have built in your life that need to be torn down today? That you need to ask the Lord to bring his sledgehammer and destroy it in your life. It could be the wall of prejudice. It could be the wall of pride. Hatred, legalism, lack of character in one's life. That you have allowed these walls to come and to be built and they're strong in your life. And you're so used to them that you don't even notice that they're there anymore. Until today that the Holy Spirit is revealing you've got some walls in your life. No time to make excuses. Well, I did that. Well, I, it just came. I just added some brick and mortar, and it, oh, it was already there. No, today, no excuses. What walls need to be smashed and shattered in your life today? Who is it that God uses I'm telling you, my friend, he uses somebody just like you, an ordinary cupbearer, an ordinary person that will avail their life to the Lord, he will use. You know, Nehemiah was a wall builder, but the greatest wall builder of all is our Lord Jesus Christ. And you might be here today and you say, you know what, my life is in ruin. My life is in ruin. If you only knew, well, he knows. And you know what? He'll take the ashes from your life and he will build them to make something beautiful to the praise and the honor of his name. Maybe you've been here all week in vacation Bible school and that you've never come to the one that can build your life and forgive you of your sins. And today, publicly, out of the balcony, to make your way down to the front here where Brother Tim will be and myself, and say, man, I'm coming today to the one that can build my life. Maybe you're a believer today, and man, you're just in ruins. I believe you've come to the right place. But you come to the place where Jesus Christ can put your life back together. Man, he's the wall builder. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Man, I'm speaking to Nehemiahs across this room. Ordinary people. Teachers. Lawyers, doctors businessmen, factory workers, firemen, policemen, ordinary people. That's who God uses the most. That's who God uses, and he wants to use you. But you've got to care. You really do. You've got to care. <clears throat> you've got to care about your spiritual life. You've got to care. You got to be a person of character. You got to make that a priority of your life. Man, I'm going to be a person of integrity, a person of character. The walls in your life, what do they look like today? <clears throat> Some of them torn down. 
The job looked too big, too daunting. Would you just give that wall, that section of that wall, will you give it to the Lord today and say, Jesus, man, build this back in my life. Build it back. And I would think there were some walls that need to come down today. Walls of poor language, pride, prejudice, ungodliness, excuses that just need to come down that we say to the Lord, Lord, you know that wall is there. I made excuses to my wife. I made excuses to my husband. I made excuses to my friend, but no excuses to you. You see, you know, tear down the walls. Tear them down, Lord. You need to come publicly today and join the church. We would welcome you. You need to come and receive Christ. Man, let the wall builder, let him forgive you of your sins. Let him give you eternal life and begin to watch how he builds your life. Will you give him your life today? Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the book of Nehemiah. We thank you, Father, that Nehemiah showed us and taught us that we are to be concerned. We are to be moved. We are to do. We are to pray. We are to ask. God, today, tenderize our hearts. Make us tender to the movement and the speaking of your word and the Holy Spirit in our lives today. God, we give you this invitation. We give you our lives. So, God, you move and you receive the glory today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's stand together in the balcony, in the main floor. If God has put on your heart a public decision that you need to make, man, make it. Take the time to come. Man, swallow pride and come and say, man, today, man, I'm going to do it God's way. Let's sing together. My hope is built upon Him. Let's sing together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus. He's a solid foundation to build your life on. My hope is built on nothing less. blood and righteousness. Sing it out, church. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Now, if you believe it, Christ alone. 